Thank you so much for uh, taking a moment to do this. I really do appreciate yeah, it. you too. What a connection to, to Hawaii to be one of the first artists at this new club. Uh, and before we get into you know more about your life, uh, anything with Hawaii that's strong with you, experiences, people you know here? Uh, no, I really don't know too many people in Hawaii. I mean, I've been there, been there a few times, many actually many times. Always had a great time, but... No, I don't, nothing, nothing particular, unfortunately. Um, maybe this will be the time that something clicks, I'm hoping. Yeah, well, I mean, just checking, because you never know. Sometimes people have a house out here or something like that. Um, cause Maui's just filled with folks and with your connections. So many different people that you've gotten to work with. And, and often when you talk to artists, it seems like the Ed Sullivan Show gets credit for inspiring a lot of people to become performers. And I read that, at least, is how you were introduced to the sax. Yeah, well, I, that's what I... That happened to me. I was watching it on television as a kid, and it inspired me, and that's when I asked my mom to get me a saxophone. Who was it who you saw playing, exactly? It wasn't a famous uh, sax player. It was, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I just remember it being a, a big band, and someone stood up and played a solo, and I really liked it. So, oh, yeah, that looks fun. So uh, I, I, I don't it. think it was like a famous... Charlie Parker or Cannibal Adderley or something like that. It was an introduction to the instrument more, which makes total sense. Uh, yeah. What other exposure to music was there that shaped what has become such an, I mean, 75 million albums sold. Uh, it's a huge career, a new one, Brazilian Nights, that brings you here. Again, a successful launch of this new club with you as one of their premier artists. When you think about the other influences besides that that helped shape you at the earliest possible age, I'm trying to see what it was that brought music into your life so strongly? Good question. You know, I don't know. It's one of those things. I just started practicing and I liked it. And, you know, I just had this desire to get better at it. I mean, that's kind of my vibe is that if I like something, I want to understand how it works and get and get good at it. Because I, I have more fun when I do something when I'm good at it. So I just wanted to get good at the saxophone. And then once I started hearing you know, professional saxophone players um, on records and how beautiful a saxophone could sound, I thought, oh my gosh, if I just keep practicing, I, I might be able to get a beautiful sound out of the sax like that. And so that was kind of what inspired me to keep, keep playing and keep practicing. But you also have an early, what I would say was a, um, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I see it as from an outside perspective, a reinforcer in that you were 16, 17, something like that, you're still in high school, and you get your first professional gig, I guess you could call it, backing a late, great legend. Uh, and if you can kind of, I mean, that has to be a, a big part of it, too. Yeah, you're talking about Barry White. I yeah. was asked to play in Barry White's band. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, really, that was a boost. You know, my, my <laughs> band director in high school saw something in me, and when Barry White's Love Unlimited Orchestra came to Seattle, the sax player, for whatever reason, was missing, and they needed to pick up a guy to play. And he got me that gig and somehow convinced uh, the uh, authorities, whoever they were, that this high school kid could handle the job. And <laughs> So I, I went and went and did that, and I did a I, I did a really good job, and everybody told me how good I was, and um, and then I just gave me a, a lot of confidence that as a 17 year old I was already a professional musician playing with pros and playing with this, you know, one of the greatest, uh, you know, recording artists of of that time. So it gave me a lot of confidence to keep going. What grade were you? I was in I was in uh, 12th grade. I was a senior. I was 17. And I can't remember what time of year it was, but I think it was like in somewhere in the maybe March or February or March or something like that. And that was your band director at high school? Yeah. Yeah, the band director at high school. He got me the gig. So I had another three or four months of school where when I went to school, all, all the guys that that used to kind of pick on me, <laughs> I was a very small kid. I'm, very, I'm still pretty skinny, but I was really skinny in high school. And... Um, you know, I was, I was easy pickings for a lot of the um, tougher kids, and but then a lot of them went to the show and were surprised to see me, me playing the sax. You know, I still have this this curly hair, so it was like they they recognized who I was and said, "Hey, there's that kid that they're always walking around the school with his saxophone in his hand," and then all of a sudden they're super nice to me. 
I love it. Little Jewish kid. Now he's playing with Barry White. <laughs> so you no more, no more stealing his money, his lunch money. It was like, hey man, uh, right this way. We've got the hallway cleared for you. You know, okay, thanks, brothers. You know, it's cool. I love it. That's really uh, God bless you, man. It's a great. Uh, and just looking at things that help paint uh, what has been a, a career that's kind of you just shake your head in awe at it. And majoring in accounting. So again, thinking about your success and how you're able to continue to manifest it into your life. That degree seems to have been, you graduate magna cum laude, it says too, that degree seems to have been pretty important. I mean, do you factor that at all into how you're able to continue to get these deals to work? Uh, it's a good question. I don't know, uh, to be honest with you. <clears throat> I'm not sure that makes a lot of difference other than it's accounting was, a lot of it was common sense. Um, I'm pretty good with numbers. They say music and numbers are they, they they go together. I mean, that's what you read about. I don't know. I guess it's true. Um, but I don't know. I just feel like I, I have a pretty sensible way of looking at things. So when it came to my career, I would look at things that way. And, well, this makes sense. This doesn't make sense to me. Um, you know, flying from here to, let's say, Beijing, I'm going to I'm going to decide whether it's worth it because I'm my accounting background at least I know I can crunch the numbers and decide whether or not it's worth going all that way for the kind of money I'm getting and things like that so I don't know I'm not I'm not sure 100% how much it affected me other than it just was more of a continuation of just the way that I think which is pretty pretty sensible and and I'm I've always been good in math so I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, you mentioned it, uh, and I guess it's a good time to fly. So you uh, you fly your own plane. When did you get into flying? I got into flying. Uh, there's a bass player named Nathan East that's pretty famous, and he's a friend of mine. And we were neither one of us was famous back in back in the back in the day, but um, he was. <laughs> we were just you know friendly friendly friends and and musicians just trying to do our thing. And he told me uh, one day, he goes, hey, man, I'm, I'm taking five lessons from this guy named Harry, and you got you got to go down there and check him out. Man, it's super fun. And so I did. And, and this guy, Harry's a really cool guy. We're still friends. And he um, kind of showed me what it was to fly an airplane. I went, man, I, I really want to do this. So I started taking flying lessons, and that's how I got into it. And how much flying do you do? I mean, you mentioned, we, I guess I, I brought it up because you were talking about doing the number crunch to do a gig. Are you flying yourself uh, to Beijing in that example or to, to here when you come? <laughs> My plane's a small, it's a small little propeller plane that doesn't okay. go very far All right. on a tank of gas. No, well, it can't make it to Beijing. There's no way. Just double it's, checking. <laughs> it, it can fly. You know, it's, um, it's actually a plane that lands on the water as well. It's an amphibious plane called the De Havilland Beaver. Mm. It's an, kind of an antique thing that, but antique. When you say antique airplane, people think, "Oh my gosh, it's old." It's not. It doesn't work like that with airplanes. You know, you get new engines, you get things refurbished, and the, and the plane is even though it's let's say it's a a, a mid fifties, nineteen fifties airplane, it's still a basically a brand new airplane. So it's not like you're flying something where, you know, something's going to, something's going to fall off because it's too old. It doesn't work like that. When you maintain an airplane, it's, it's, it's very, it's, I feel like it's a very safe, uh, hobby, uh, as long as you're smart and you're, you know, your limitations and you maintain your airplane. So it's not a super expensive thing either. So it's not like I've got a big jet or anything like that, but, uh, I, I enjoy it. And what I will do is I'll fly it, Depends on the, the, the weather, obviously. Um, I'll go to San Francisco from L.A. Um, I'll fly it to San Diego. I'll fly it to Phoenix, Vegas. That's kind of like my, my limits right there. That's my, my little range. And then if I'm, let's say, um, in the summer times, I like to fly it over to the East Coast, but that takes about four days. And that's kind of like a little zen trip that I take by myself and, and just kind of get into flying and looking at the scenery and you know, flying over the Rocky Mountains and doing all that kind of stuff and camping out. It's really cool. You ever landed in on the water in Vancouver? Is it one of those sort of planes like you see there all the time landing in there? Yeah, it's exactly like that. It's, I've, I've, I've landed it in Vancouver. I've landed it right in the harbor there where you dock up and walk downtown right. to the hotels. And it's really, it's cool. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm from Seattle, so I would make that trip quite often. Up, yeah, that's what I say. San Juan's. That's what I figured. That's why I mentioned it. It made it, as you were describing it, I could just uh, see that area that, that you were talking about there, right, right where the cruise ships 
or uh, it's exactly right. Yeah, the only the only hard part about that is that when those cruise ships go by, they cr- create quite a wake. So <laughs> when you're landing your airplane, you got to kind of time it so that the waves aren't too big because that's that's pretty pretty tricky. Um, but but landing on the water is actually. In it, it, it some ways, it's more difficult, but in most ways, it's not more difficult. It's, it's just that, you know, you know, as a pilot, you have to decide where you're going to land and what direction you're going to land in. And when you land at an airport, you know, the, the control tower is telling you what to do. So you just follow the directions and watch out, and you land on the runway, they tell you. But when you're on your own, landing in a lake that's in the middle of the mountains, you have to decide... Is the lake big enough? Which direction you're going to land? Where's the wind coming from? Are there any logs to look out for? Are there any animals? Things like that. So those are the those are the kind of things that you do when you're kind of on your own flying in the wilderness. Paints a great picture of um, you know what you're doing when you're not up on stage playing Songbird or something like that for folks. It's uh, I like it. It's very cool. Yeah, yeah. It's a nice nice balance for me. I was like, I'm a, I mean, I'm I'm a nobody. Um, in the airplane, you know, flying in the middle of, I land these little airports in the middle of Kansas, and I'm just a pilot, filling up my gas, you know, for fuel and hanging out, having a sandwich, and it's, it's just great. It's great. It's a nice balance to, you know, being on stage and having everybody watching me. Are you living anywhere else other than California these days? Well, I have a little place in Canada that that actually is on a lake. So the airplane, I fly it there every summer, which uh, it's on the east coast of Canada. So it, it's a, like, a, like a, that's when I do my four-day little trip. Mm. And other than that, no, I'm just staying at home. I'm talking to you from my house right now, and I'll be, I'll be coming to Hawaii tomorrow. I'm leaving to come there. And, um, you know, for the grand opening of the Blue Note at the Outrigger is going to be pretty, it's pretty exciting for me just to the fact that I've got a relationship with the Blue Note Jazz Club and... So it's so prestigious, you know, I feel like I'm pretty honored as a sax player to have a, a nice relationship to be able to be be the first artist to play at the at this new club, you know? I think it's a great thing, as I was saying uh, in introducing you and talking about it earlier. It's a really, uh, it's nice for Honolulu, too, because a long time ago, because of the rooting, funny enough, of flights, uh, before airlines, things changed a bit, there had been more of a stopover need, let's say, I guess, for People and so there had been a much more flourishing scene of, of uh, and it included jazz and, and a lot of other more eclectic artists that weren't necessarily arena level, but were, were doing stopovers here. And then that that changed um, with the flyovers right to Asia. So it is nice that they're here and able to provide that kind of entertainment um, on a regular basis. Uh, and I'm wishing them a lot of luck. Uh, that's one. Yeah, of the- me- me too. I hope it's a really big, big success. It's, uh, you know, it's a long ways to go. That's the hard part about doing these kind of gigs is that it's a long way to go. Everybody, it depends on your entourage. And, and I, I say that word entourage, meaning for me, it's my band. You know, it's like I got the guys in my band. There's six of us on stage. and I got my sound man. So there's just basically seven of us. But, you know, if you've got a big you know, twelve-piece big band and you got to get everybody to, to Honolulu and put them up in hotels and you know, it can it it can be tricky when it comes to crunching the numbers. There's the accounting degree coming yeah, in again. See, see. <laughs> well, and it's yeah, also it, it, it does work. It is it is important, I guess. <laughs> well, there are certain themes, I guess, that revolve in your life. And another one again, what you're talking about here is uh, rooting and routing it through for people who are going to Asia. And you mentioned it before. And as we go to wrap it up with you, yeah, I, I would be remiss if I did not bring up the fact that um, and you even referenced uh, Beijing, I guess yourself. Uh, um, there's, I don't know that everybody in the, kind of like the Barry White, that people didn't know that maybe that you worked for Barry White when you were in high school. Another interesting facet of your life culturally on a global level and in the country that's the most populated country on the planet. So this is a pretty big deal in terms of humanity, if one was to characterize it like that. Going home, part of daily life in China. Can you just, for people who have no idea what I'm talking about, is it really what I'm, that, is, it, is, is it that intense? Yeah, it's 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 that intense times about a million. Yeah, it's because um, I I go to China a lot. I go to Asia a lot, and so there's a song that I did called "Going Home," and it's just one of those things. It's I can't even tell you how and why, but it be, it became a a a song that's just part of Chinese culture. It just is. It's like it's not. I'm not saying it's like a national anthem, but it's more like like a song like like America the Beautiful. 
Like we, everybody knows America the Beautiful here, right? That's just part of being in the United States. Going Home is a song like that. In China, it's, it's a song that they play that, that kind of, it tells everybody that the, the work day is over and it's time to relax. And basically it's, it's almost telling them it's time to go home. I think that's what it is. Maybe that's why they latched onto it because they, they literally took the, the title of it. And so when you're in Beijing, let's just say, and you're on a, on a public transportation, it'll, it'll be playing like around four, four o'clock, five o'clock in, in the afternoon. And it plays. And all people, Oh, okay. Yep. Time to go home. And in the department store, huge department store, it starts to play. Oh yeah. Time to wrap it up. It's in, it's, they play it in the squares outside. As you're walking around, you just hear it outside in the, in the streets. It's not like in the States. We don't really have like like PA systems uh, right. when you're walking downtown, but that's they have that in China where they have announcements that are made, and my songs are playing. This particular song is playing, and and it's I've heard it in Tiananmen Square. I've heard it uh, at the Forbidden uh, Palace or wherever, whatever that's really called. I've been there, heard my songs, and even me, I go, well, I guess I better start getting back to the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> my, my my mistake was playing it. And when I when I first went to China, played it in the middle of my set because I I knew it was a popular song there. Looked up and the audience had already gone home. Oh wow, wow. <laughs> so, oh yeah, I I got to save that for the last song, I guess. I'll remember that next time. Brazil. It's crazy. It's... And, and it's very flattering though, just the fact that this beautiful melody that was just created for whatever reasons it was created, as means a lot to this to this whole country. It's it's very flattering to me. I mean. Apart from we we don't really get into the royalty thing. It's just you know some things are just the way they are, and I I don't I don't take any offense to that at this point. But with this song, it's more like I'm flattered that my melody has created this this feeling you know over there. So yeah, it's it's big. That's what I said. It's a bigger thing than um, and you just summed it up. It's a that's a neat thing. It's a great. Uh, it's like a contribution. It's like coming up with happy birthday or something. I'm not sure what. Uh... <laughs> kind of like that. Yeah, it's true. Just like that. <laughs> something like that. Brazilian nights. Uh, he's got uh, several nights in town to share it with us through Sunday. Blue Note, brand new, prestigious name, as Kenny G himself said here on the program, saxophone legend. And uh, I hope this was somewhat entertaining today. I really appreciate. You being part of the program with me, Ben. Oh, man, thank you. I really appreciate it, too, Dave. Aloha, everybody. It's Kenny G here. You're listening to my friend Dave Lawrence on All Things Considered. Uh, Thanks, bro. Appreciate it. Great talking to you and travel safe. A lot of fun. I learned a lot today. It was really cool talking to you, Kenny. Same here, Dave. Thanks a lot. Take care. Aloha, brother. Okay. Okay, bye. Bye.